Yeah. You uh, you still in touch with John Bodie? Yeah, we still chat every once in a while. He's a he's a good colleague, good friend, good mentor. Uh, I really enjoy working with and for him in DC. Yeah, it's a good organization. Yeah, he he's a good guy. Savannah, hi. Uh, I hear you guys, don't see you. Maybe it's still loading one sec. All right. Here it comes. Hi, Ashley. Hey, guys. Hey, Ashley. Hello. Hey, guys. Hey, everyone. RC Brad, I just wanted to let you know um, we revisited um, the definition of social uh, of family for the social equity subcommittee, and we added domestic partner. Nice, glad to hear that. And then obviously we addressed the other issue you were talking about when that issue comes up later on um, during our social equity group. Sure. So I know. Uh, Tim can't be with us today. I'm going to give Ingrid another minute or two. And um, Sivan is here today. The market structure subcommittee is wrapping up. And um, he has continued to volunteer his time to help this committee and provide his perspectives. And I'm so thankful for that, Sivan. Um, and Chris Walsh, I think, should you know, be doing something similar to Sivan. I don't know if he's planning for 10 to 10 today, but I'll give him another minute or two. Hi, Ashley. Hi, I was just having some technical difficulties with my earbuds, so it's okay if I look perplexed. I'm not wearing it for at all. And some really good news are um, Megan Howe, who you know takes a lot of the notes for our subcommittee groups, is in labor right now, so we will see what happens soon. Nice. Hopefully, I'll go to yeah, we have no idea if it's a boy or a girl, but uh, I think it's a boy. <laughs> All right, well, I see Ingrid's here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the recording, and then we can get it um, rolling, Tom. Okay. I'm calling the uh, Compliance and Enforcement Subcommittee to order October 4th. Um, I'll just do a quick roll call of those who I see present. Uh, we've got Mark Gorman, Gina Cranwinkle from the NACB, um, Carrie Jugger. You got it uh, right. <laughs> Ashley Reynolds. I also want to say that that G always throws me off. Um, Kyle Harris. Kyle, do we have anyone else from the board in the room? Uh, we have Bryn Hare, Executive Director, Bryn. Cannabis Control Board. We've got uh, Brandon Knight from the Department of Liquor and Lottery. We've got four members of the public. Great. And then we also have uh, David Huber joining us and Sivan Kutel. Okay. I think we're all set. So great. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, again, for those that... For I'm again, sorry. Ingrid, I missed you tonight. Ingrid is present as well. Yep. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Um, what I want to do is, is continue our conversation from last Thursday. And Savannah, I'm going to send you a document quickly. First, um, I believe nobody has seen the minutes from last meeting yet, and I think that's my fault. They were sent to me on Friday and completely um, escaped me when I was sending out stuff earlier this morning. So um, Tom, if you would help remind me, I don't think, I sent them out right before this meeting. I doubt anybody's had time to give them a once over. but. Um, we can just put that on the agenda for Thursday to, to sure. do the minutes from last Thursday and today, this coming Thursday. Keep myself straight. Um, so, Savan, just to bring you up to speed, last Thursday we started talking about outdoor cultivation security. Um, and I'm going to send you a document we heard from um, Jen uh, from BS on how Massachusetts approached um, outdoor security. And we're talking fencing, cameras, 
lights, um, uh, security systems. Um, I'm going to send you that right now. Um, I wanted to, you know, I know Dave's here. I know he had a lot of questions. Um, I know Jen's not with us anymore, but well, I want to continue that conversation before we get into indoor um, cultivation, security, and retail um, security. So, does anybody have any thoughts? You know, from my perspective, it seems as if everything's kind of uh, pretty similar across all other um, jurisdictions with with a legalized adult use market. Um, you know, from my perspective, I'm curious um, about alternatives. Again, like, you know, folks that are cultivating are going to have their own interest in securing their cultivation site. Um, at what point, or how overly prescriptive or prescriptive does the board need to be from uh, requiring fencing, lights, cameras, security systems, or is there an opportunity for us to kind of um, you know, recommend some stuff and require a combination of those, not all of them, looking for alternatives. Um, again, my thought is um, not being overly burdensome uh, from a cost perspective on some of our smaller cultivator tiers, uh, but recognizing that you know consumer safety, theft protection, um, so on and so forth are the, the other end of the, of the conversation. So Ashley, I see you raised your hand. I was just curious if we can look at this from a standpoint of for the smaller cultivars, talking about them specifically, possibly not requiring fencing. I know that we're having sort of different tiers for rolling out licenses and delayed. So we have really the option if we want it. I wanted to also get Carrie's perspective on folks who are choosing to fence. Um, I know he brought up last week how you know, there kind of runs the gamut as far as like how the hemp program is working versus how people are fencing. Some are not. Some are, you know, doing much larger grows without any fencing at all. Um, some are using armed guards. I think he said carry. And you know, from my perspective, I, I don't really feel that there needs to be fencing, uh, especially for the smaller folks. And I just wanted to kind of test the temperature of the rest of the committee here and see is, is there a world. Be I'll weigh in when you're ready, Ashley, but I'll let everybody else have a chance to respond to that. Any other thoughts? This is this is Tom Carey, um, and and you all can correct me if if you got a different impression, but. At least from what we've seen from from the research memo that, that we disseminated from Ashley and from what Jeff was saying, uh, I mean, I, I think fencing is probably the most critical component uh, for for security. If if you're going to do away with that, um, then I, I guess everything else becomes optional. Um, I mean, it, it still is. It, it's I know everyone wants to equate it with with him. It's it, it's it's still different. It's, it's different legally, um, but I, I, I don't, it, it seems like if we're talking about security uh, and you're making fencing optional, then um, I don't know that that might be. I would think it's probably a departure from what what other states are are doing. And my, my impression from what Jen was saying was, uh, you know, in Massachusetts we require that because you know. You, you don't want people just stealing away with product in, in the middle of the night, and there's also need some protection from, from wildlife as well. Um, so I'm not I'm not saying actually that it doesn't make sense. And again, intellectually, what what Kyle is raising it is is an issue across all the subcommittees of more regulations are going to be more costs. Especially for the for the regulators, that's that's the nature of, of what we're doing. Um, but ultimately, it's up, it's up for the board to decide how much direction they want to give, especially small cultivators in, in the town. So that's those are kind of the issues that that we're facing. Savan, I know you're new to the conversation, but would love your love your perspective. Brand new, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, but yeah, uh, certainly we, we, we've touched on security um, 
a little bit um, tangentially in the market structure committee and just kind of made reference to what we assume this committee is working on and or where you might end up or might not end up. Um, but we, we multiple times we really mentioned when we're talking about allowing potential permitting for uh, local farmers who are going to be small cultivators to also potentially have storefronts at the farm um, as some sort of farm sales and it being kind of the, the cannabis equivalent of when you see maple syrup available here everywhere all around Vermont that one of the big concerns was not inviting risk to those farmers and you know I, I, I'm not necessarily a big regulation guy I don't, I, I don't want to be um, paternalistic um, and you know tell me we're going to protect you from yourselves but um, I think in the other committee, we've been on a working assumption that there would at least be a bare minimum of, of security um, because we are a little afraid of just kind of rampant issues that could come for all of these folks who are, you know, it seems like the Vermont impression is that small cultivators were going to get into this, are really getting into this for an opportunity to do something very different from how their farms have been, et cetera. And if we unintentionally, systemically invite a large amount of risk onto them, we may, um, we may not be doing our fiduciary responsibility. So I, I, I think we've been on a working assumption that fencing was a given, you know, other things like lights or cameras, that all those things are, there's some balance of all of those. Um, but uh, it does seem to me that, that some sort of fencing would be a bare minimum. It's not just like, you can make a choice when you have an in-ground pool, are you gonna fence it or not? And that's about insurance liability, right? Like you don't want the neighbor's kids to run in you know, unsupervised and swim, but that's, you know, that's your choice of what risk you're taking or not. And I think this is a more serious level above that, that, that you know, we at least in the other committee were probably working under a, an assumption that there would at least be stuff similar to fencing or, or other limits like that. I mean, with the pool, you're fencing, fencing it in because you're worried about death. With this, you're worrying about theft. I, I say it's, it's actually less of a concern. You're not protecting somebody you're protecting your own commodity, whether that's from deer or theft. But the swimming pool, you're preventing a drowning from happening on your property. So I think equating the two is, is doesn't sound yeah. right. I, I accept that, Carrie, and that, that was me making up that comparison right now. You know, it's not a subject we've had in-depth discussions about. Um, but yeah. I think we're all worried that you know, uh, you know, people decide they're going to not just take the plants; they're going to show up and you know, bring whatever, their, their shotguns. I'm not, I'm not actually talking about, like, you know, organized gangs, but, you know, other people are going to come rob your little storefront and thinking about it as a big cash box cow and just, we don't want to, you know, same way when you go camping, you know, you have a bear bag and you raise your food up because you don't want to tempt the bears. So maybe maybe any of those land, maybe they don't. Again, this is this is new to me at this, at this level of depth. Yeah, so yeah. Not, and just, just for the sake of, of clarity, I, I guess, you know, we started this conversation on Thursday and we weren't even thinking about it from the um, farm gate sale perspective, but from more of the just growing site perspective, you, you bring in another wrinkle though um, that I know you're curious about. And we, we haven't gotten that far. I'm not sure, um, well, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I mean, we could do specific uh, recommendations or regulations around, um, you know, having that, that farm gate sale farm stand business along with your outdoor cultivation site maybe that's treated a little bit differently versus somebody who's strictly cultivating i don't know i'm trying to get a temperature read on everybody and where everybody's at gina i see your hands up um thanks i just want to remind everybody that this is not like an agricultural product that if anyone consumes it it'll be fine you know this is a schedule one drug that's federally prohibited and if consumed, can have an impact on the person. So I think we have to take that into consideration as well, where if we would lock up alcohol and have fencing around that to prevent someone to come in. So, you know, this is really how hemp and cannabis is different and why additional restrictions and regulations need to be um, put on this drug. Thanks, yeah. Mark? Yeah, I my, my uh, question is, uh, if you don't have fencing, which is sort of your first level of, of security, are you going to get any sympathy at all from, you know, the police if you report a, a theft? 
or your insurance company if you report a theft. If you report a theft. Now, maybe that's just part of the risk you're taking would, would not have an effect. Uh, but, uh, you know, those, those resources will be drawn on. People will call the cops you know, to try to get them interested in their problem. Thanks, Mark. Ashley, is your hand still up, or did you have a... We'll, we'll carry it. I know that uh, Ashley did ask your perspective, and then, you know, we, we got to... I'm, I'm thankful everybody's speaking up. I'd like to hear your perspective, Carrie, and then Dave, uh, I would like to hear your perspective, uh, um, working under the assumption that, that we will, the board will have a formal agreement with the Agency of Agriculture. I want to make sure that um, any concerns, thoughts, or perspectives you would share the boots on the ground actually going to these sites, I think would be extremely helpful for the subcommittee to hear. So go ahead, here. Uh, sure, yeah, and in terms of have that actually reiterated sort of what I spoke of last meeting, and it runs the gamut. Um, it's either out in the field or it's behind fences. And really the only concern of direct theft is for two or three weeks at the end of the season. Um, I haven't heard of any theft um, of hemp so far this year, but certainly two or three years ago, there was some reported. And behind the fence or not, they, the folks who called the police received the same level of response and sympathy. Um, same as stealing apples or sweet corn off a, off a farmer. And sort of my perspective on this, I read the California model that you sh shared last week, and that was sort of out of sight. It needs to not be not be seen. And then I feel like it's up to the producer to decide what level of security they they want. Um, I've read your sort of different versions of licenses, and the outdoor grows what was average to be 20% of the market. Most of the quality cannabis is going to be grown indoor. Sounds like that's 80%. Um, it sounds like some there's an oper opportunity or an appetite to have small cultivation plots outdoors. Um, and as far as new businesses that want to get into the business, I, I think what happens to that particular business is going to dictate um, what sort of security that they want or need. Um, if you're in sort of a more populous area, Chittenden County, you know, uh, most of the hemp thefts that occurred were were within distance, uh, walking distance of a fairly large college. Um, the stuff out among the rural communities were, were, was not targeted. And I think it really depends on where you choose to put your grow um, and who can see it. <clears throat> I, all those options should be available, fencing, um, cameras, and, and lighting. Um, but I also feel like it shouldn't necessarily be something that the board has to dictate. <clears throat> we'll get to where we get to as the market evolves. Um, Ashley? Maybe this is a little bit too much of a drill down, but for anybody who is getting a cultivation license, is there going to be any sort of site, like through, is anybody sort of thinking about, you know, is there going to need to be some approval or is it really just going to be, you know, an application online and people can just fill it in or? I think about, I think you brought up a really good point, Carrie, of like, even just looking by county, by, by town, you know, in Elmore, Morseville, you know, Hardway, close to the East Kingdom, I mean, there's so much place there that seems a little bit silly. I think about the grows that are happening all around Stowe, or even just right down, you know, over in um, Hardwick there, like, I mean, they're massive and I don't ever hear about anybody messing. In the beginning, yeah, you know, when crops, some of them were hot, some of them weren't hemp at all. Um, I think there was a lot more of that, but I don't know. I don't think that, you know, fence is, is necessary to answer. I think that if somebody wants to get cannabis, they're going to, regardless if it's in a fence or not, regardless if it's grown in the ground or not. I do think 
having it be sort of away and not in plain view is, is a really great idea. But I mean, like, I'm a mom, you guys. Like, I'm not looking at this from a perspective of just like this really, really hippie. Like, I, I do think safety is huge. I just don't know that it's a one size fits all for what we're thinking of for these smaller cultivators. Ingrid, see your hands up. I'm just, it's more of a question. I'm wondering. I don't know anything about insurance regulations for this type of product, but wouldn't that be a, would that be a requirement in order to be insured? Does everyone have to be insured for this? Where does that factor in? Actually, say no. So I, I don't really I don't know anything. About Tom, are you gonna? Too much. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah. Look good. Oh, just I'm just gonna say that like I say, the crop, crop insurance is not really applicable for this particular crop at this time. Maybe, Tom, you know something that I don't. No, I, I would say probably the majority across the, the country are not insured um, for, for cultivation and, you know, for, for any other facet of, of cannabis. It's, it's very expensive um, and it's hard to get. Uh, and, then, you know, Ashley can probably talk about that more firsthand. Uh, but if you can get it, you know, and you can afford it, uh, like any other business, you probably should and could. And, and if you go through those hoops, Andrew, then, then yeah, um, I, I would I would guess that you know fencing your crop would, would be a requirement in order to obtain the insurance. Mark, is your stand hand still up, or you have some? By the look on your face, yes, your hand was still up from last time. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Carrie, question for you. Just trying to respond to one of Ashley's questions or comments. And, and yeah, Ashley, I think your instinct is spot on that we're getting a little bit far ahead of where we currently are. But when it comes, uh, I'm leaning at least um, trying to remember the hemp program process, Carrie. And I know folks need to, uh, whether it's through Google Maps or some other service, they need to actually show the Agency of Agriculture specifically where a cultivation site is as part of their application is that correct that is that is correct and that's a that is a usda that's a federal requirement um, and we need to share that list with law enforcement so if somebody does report it or they do come across it they check with the agency to make sure that that is a registered hemp um gotcha. Gotcha. but Yes, and that, you know if that uh, that's now, I don't know what will happen in years to come. I don't know. How. You, growing cannabis outdoors, you're going to be registered somewhere, um, so you'll either be on the hemp list or or with the control board in the future, and we'll sort of figure out what that looks like. Yeah, and if, if, a, if a cannabis outdoor grow did have to be situated a certain setback from a road or from, you know, the eyes of the public, I don't, I don't want to pull a number out of thin air um, when it comes to trying to establish that, recognizing that farms and, and parcels of land look different depending where you are, even in the state of Vermont. You know, I know a lot of farms situate themselves pretty close to the road for, you know, or at least they did historically for the winter months because it was easy to get trucks in and off those properties. Um, but I don't know where, um, Carrie, Tom, where do you think we, we would start in trying to, if that were going to be part of, you know, this conversation, where we would, where we would look to start in trying to pull a number? I, I you know, Kyle, I like the standard of uh, not being able to see it out of sight. So if you you know, you can see it from the road, then you're putting up a fence that so folks can't see it. Okay. But if you've got a spot that nobody has access to, unless it's, you know, cross country through the woods, some, that's a completely different scenario. I guess there are those public easements throughout the state that we would have to be careful about. Ashley. Yeah. I think that I agree with Carrie. Um, first of all, um, and then I also, you know, we're not going to require this, but here we are thinking about these cultivators 
the talent, perhaps some of the folks from the illicit market now transitioning into this regulated market. Like, there's things that we all do those last two, three weeks of the growth before harvest occurs that is, you know, part of our own, if you want to call it, insurance. You know, people sleeping out in their patches, people doing their own foot traffic. I mean, again, I know these are things we're not going to be able to require, but I mean, these are things that we're going to be doing anyway. And I think, again, you know, really looking at it from the lens of what it takes to grow and not from a lens of this is what has worked in other states. Like, you know, I, I don't want to stand on the soapbox. I do think fencing is going to be needed for certain areas of growing, but I think if we could figure out a way to sort of decipher the size, maybe a little bit more about visiting site. I like the out of site um, and, you know, obviously access if it's close to being grown to a school, you know, all of that needs to get to put into consideration. But I just want to share just anecdotally, like we're all used to that time of year and we're all used to being a little bit more diligent about our own personal surveillance. And so, yeah, just wanted to put that out to the universe. Exactly. Just saying, I also support um, Carrie's idea of you know thinking about different circumstances, right? Combining that with your comment earlier, Kyle, that maybe the, the way the final regs are written are yeah, it's different if the field is visible from the road or not. It's different if you have farm gate sales directly or you're just a cultivator. I think all of those are, are are smart. Thanks, Yvonne. Dave, any, any thoughts from your, your perspective on, on a pretty place to start? And then I'm going to try and pivot us to more of an indoor-based conversation. Sure. Uh, thanks for letting me comment on that. <clears throat> I agree with what everyone's saying as well. Um, I think that uh, I, I kind of want to talk about two different things, though. One being the, the safety for all the staff and the talent that Ashley is mentioning. But then also, uh, Kyle, you had mentioned boots on the ground probably the safety of the regular as well and potential potential pitfalls there with, with certain situations. Um, I think it's probably something that Anchorage would also be thinking about with, with her past uh, career. Um, so, you know, there are a couple things that are inherently dangerous out there. Dogs, uh, inherently dangerous animals, agency of agriculture. Uh, definitely the inspectors do run into uh, dogs. They run into bulls. Uh, they run into other very dangerous uh, animals that do have to to be fenced off or at least made uh, known to the regulator to make sure that nobody's going to get uh, maimed, harmed, uh, killed. Uh, those are really real uh, problems in, in Vermont, especially in an agricultural uh, sort of setting. Uh, another thing is the Vermont gun laws and our potentially armed registrants. Uh, so just, you know, all this sort of ties into different trainings that need to be offered to the regulator. Uh, De-escalation technique trainings, uh, we do already provide that. We have worked with the Vermont State Police uh, to provide our staff with de-escalation techniques as well as uh, EPA officials and other state regulators in rural agricultural states to make sure that uh, everyone has that most up-to-date training when it comes to protecting the staff uh, for the regulating entity, just to make sure. Um, but the one thing I wanted to add for uh, the other conversation was, you know, there there probably are many, many techniques uh, to deter theft and uh, to maintain security. Uh, and perhaps we think of it in a best management practice sort of way. So fencing would be maybe a baseline. And this is all hypothetical. But maybe you have 10 other uh, ways to keep track of everything, cameras, lighting, um, maybe some other type of perimeter security. Perhaps it's, you know, you have a, a policy of, yeah, fencing plus two out of 10 approved uh, other types of security. And that may be something that the uh, cultivator chooses on their own or works in conjunction with the pound or works in conjunction with the regulator. And that may be a good smattering to see exactly what works and what doesn't work for, uh, for different geographical areas, different types of growing operations, uh, different types of areas. And the other, the last thing I just wanted to touch on was uh, the out of sight uh, part of this. Well, I understand that uh, having an operation being out of sight uh, certainly would keep the public away from uh, seeing what is going on at the operation. 
uh, it potentially could have its own pitfalls in that if someone were in trouble and this is completely out of sight, uh, there may not be somebody to come to the rescue. Uh, in instances where um, a regulator is trapped or you know there is something dangerous going on, if the public were to see or at least have some sort of line of sight and they were driving by and they said, oh wow, this really, this, something looks strange, they could make that phone call. Uh, I'm sure that's uh, happened with Vermont State Police as well as other local precincts where uh, somebody has said, you know, something's not right, I would like to make a call. Uh, completely screening off an operation while well, maybe offense may also uh, uh, may also directly relate to harming uh, certain individuals. I just wanted to, to say that as far as the safety boots on the ground kind of realistic um, statement. Thanks, Dave. we got a lot of good perspectives here with different experience. I think it's, it's making for a good conversation. Carrie, I, I saw your, your circle light up. Yeah, I was... Uh... <laughs> Dave knows this firsthand, actually. I brought him to a site that was alleged to be not growing hemp, and when we showed up, there were pit bulls on chains. And so, so good call, Dave. Um. Well, this is what, I, this is what I'm, I'm hoping that we can do, and I'm looking to you, Tom, Mark, and Gina, and I'm trying to pull from the way Gina tries to facilitate some stuff in the Social Equity Committee and, and giving people options with words on a slide deck or a piece of paper because I think if we can kind of be presented with some options this committee can be presented with some options um, and see those words on those papers and I'm thinking about options meaning most prescriptive to more of I don't want to say least prescriptive but providing more options a suite of um, you know best practices as, as Dave kind of alluded to the out of sight uh, no fencing, insight fencing model, but just getting like maybe three options that we could talk about on Thursday um, might be helpful for folks to kind of conceptualize um, what we're talking about here. And I'm not even necessarily thinking that we need the full regulatory type text, but just bullet points on paper, um, you know, key, key takeaways, key buckets of different types of security that is typically found at an outdoor cultivation site. Is that something, Tom and Gina, you think um, you might be able to help me out with. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the concepts are, are there in the reference materials we disseminated last week. Um, if you want that just kind of narrowed to, to bullet point format, I think everyone would know. I mean, we're talking about fencing, we're talking about lighting, we're talking about video surveillance. Right. Alarm right. system. Right. And um, I, I was just I'm trying to get at recommendations and trying to bring this into something that the board or the subcommittee might yeah. feel um, comfortable you know, voting on or, or, or passing to the board as a rec board as a recommendation. Right. Kyle, we can put that together for you. Um, David, if it would be possible to speak to you from an agricultural perspective, um, just what your regulations are for um, hemp and, and some other stuff so we can make it very Vermont focused um, as well. Thanks, Gina. And Tom, I know you put together, you and Ashley and, and Mark put together a lot of awesome stuff for us. I didn't want to insinuate that you have it, but just something that's easy, easily digestible in this type of setting for us to, to move on. That would be very much appreciated. Sure. Uh, uh, but, and, and David and Terry, my understanding is that, that there aren't any, right, for, for ag or for hemp. There aren't any security regs for, that exist right now, right? Uh, I think uh, Carrie would answer no. There, there are, but there are, there are security requirements for the staff for the regulator. Uh, and I, it, I understand that 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 side of it, but but I don't think we need a separate call to talk about what, what's already existing because it, it doesn't, at least for for him. Right. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I want to start the conversation on indoor security and um, cultivation security, and, and even I think it was included in there, Tom, um, retail security too. And again, these resources have been fantastic um, as a launching off point, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful you might be able to give your, your key takeaways to kind of um, engage conversation here. Yeah, and, and I, I just included that 
that beginning section, which does include retail as a, as a summer, because uh, a lot of the indoor cultivations are combined with with the, the retail stores, at least here in Arizona, Nevada, and, and out west, and they're they're fairly similar. Um, so the I mean the buckets that we're talking about mainly are again video surveillance. Um, what what Jen Flanagan stressed last time is um, limited in its its access control uh, to make sure that there's only a limited number of people that have access to the indoor cultivation. So building access control systems uh, and, and alarm systems again. So those are the, the three main buckets. And then places like California, and this is more more for retail, but uh, there's actually regs about physical security or armed guards. Uh, needing, to, needing to be present at the facilities as well. Um, and I think that's what you're going to find when you look through through those materials. It's, it's going to fall into one of those one of those buckets. Any opening questions for Tom or for the good of the group? Tom, it doesn't seem like, uh, again, I think this is a theme just when we're talking about this and we're not trying to I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here. It seems like other jurisdictions pretty much do things um, standard across, you know, across the board for the most part. But um, is that your takeaway as well? Yeah, but but I mean, some are, are definitely more prescriptive um, to you know, your terms in the beginning of the meeting uh, than others. Uh, you know, not everyone is, is going to require physical security guards like like California does, um, and so. It's just that it's the level to which um, to which you want to describe the the regulations that you're going to impose. Anybody have any thoughts? I mean, we can start with security guards. Anybody have any thoughts? <laughs> any thoughts there? I know that I just sent this to you this morning, so um, you know maybe we can get better conversation on Thursday. But. Ashley, I see your hands up. I mean, I, I follow a lot of cannabis news. I'm pretty nerdy about it. And I just don't hear about this type of depth. I don't hear about, you know, that level of force being needed, optics or culturally, you know, necessary. Um, I, you know, are those armed guards there in response? to something that happened. Like, again, I know we try to look really hard at data, we try to look at patterns, but again, I mean, I'm only one person in this industry, but I just don't hear about any of the need for that stuff. So if anybody has has heard otherwise, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, and, and, and to be clear, the, 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 the California regulations for physical security, that's, that's for retail. That's not just if you have an indoor, indoor grow. Oh, I, I mean, I'm, as well like that's just seems... in arizona they, they all have armed security guards as well for the retail i think i saw savant stand up first and then dave sure i'd say overall maybe coming from a different direction but i'd, I'd agree with abby's with uh um, with ashley's uh perspective there um i, I think that uh well, if you interpret the legislative intent of the two acts that give rise to all of this quite clear that we're trying to create opportunity for small Vermont operations that, you know, is, it really is a unique approach. It's a very vermont -y approach. And uh, in the market structure subcommittee, we spent a lot of time trying to think about what that means from a cost burden perspective. And that's that's really how we made our decision of, of how we recommend tiering pricing for licenses of different, different sizes. Because we don't want to be overly burdensome financially on the smallest growers when it seems legislative intent is to empower uh, all these new, call it whatever you want, small businesses, small family organizations, small whatever, you know, X, Y, or Z. So I'd agree that, especially from a cultivation side, if, if you started talking about um, security guards, that's such a cost prohibitive factor that almost out, undone everything else that's done on the other levels. Um, it, it makes more conceptual sense to me on a retail sense, but I would still think that that, that should be optional, not required. Um, you know, I, I think that Vermont envisions a lot of small, you know, Main Street on a small town, small shops, not just a shop in Burlington that's going to be a mega XYZ. 
And so, you know, I think, again, that same cost burden perspective is going to be cost prohibitive for a small organization if they also need to have security guards on hand. And, you know, I personally come from the alcohol industry, especially from a regulatory side. I would think of this more like bouncers at a bar. You know, the bar, when they build themselves and set up and they know the area they're in and the clientele they're catering to, and they're going to choose whether they have a bouncer or not. And maybe a bar that caters for the college kids is going to have a bouncer. Or maybe they'll only have it on Friday or Saturday nights. And, you know, a bar that's a wine bar is probably not going to have a bouncer um, and or in a different location or X, Y, Z. I think all of those are fair considerations to allow the business to decide what's appropriate for them. Thanks, Bob. Dave? I just wanted to uh, clarify the record uh, real quick. Carrie had mentioned earlier uh, when asked about theft of hemp plants, um, uh, the agency has not been made aware of any thefts uh, via complaints. Uh, this past weekend, there were uh, two plants that were stolen from a, a preschool teacher's uh, personal garden, I think in downtown Montpelier, that made uh, just the local front page form, uh, which is a, a local uh, news source, uh, essentially, for Vermonters. Um, and that was the first that I had heard about it as well. Uh, so it, at this entire year, uh, the only plants that I'm aware of, uh, not through a complaint to the agency, is this. And that might potentially be because it's, it's gearing up for harvest time. I just wanted to clarify the record there. Thanks, Dave. I did see that on the front porch forum this morning, now that you mentioned it. Um, yeah, so um, I think, you know, we're, we're, talk we're kind of kind of getting gray between the indoor cultivation and the retail. And I know in some states, Tom, it might happen here where, you know, somebody's cultivating at the same spot that they're retailing. You know, I'm not at liberty to say that that's going to be something that's going to happen or not at this point in time. But I want to try and focus on just the cultivation site security at this time, just so we can kind of keep track of what we're talking about and, and have that kind of logical flow into the, more of the retail space. Saban, those comments, though, are they're extremely helpful for kind of picturing, um, you know, how you envision this and how the legislature's likely envision this um, kind of market taking shape. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, again, where I'm going to sound like a broken record. Folks are going to have their own, <laughs> their own uh, vested interest in making sure that these are secure. Um, so, I don't know. Anybody, Ingrid, any thoughts? Terry? I, I might be able to put a, a spin on this from a cost perspective. That would be for, great. For the, for the board. So when I talk about the bucks, I was talking about, so access control, limiting the, the number of people um, that have access. That's obviously something that any grower or license holder can take care of with, with their own internal policies. Um, and that's not cost prohibitive at all. Mm -hmm. Where you are going to find um, you know, higher costs are for the video surveillance and the alarm and notification systems, right? Uh, and then, you know, you, you kind of run the gamut on what that looks like there too. So how much video surveillance do you need? You're looking at, here's some of the factors. Are you going to regulate the visibility of the cannabis that's out there? Are you going to regulate the quality of the video? Um, I mean, Oregon does that. Uh, are you going to regulate how long you have to store the footage. Ohio does that for 30 days, right? Um, are you going to regulate, you know, how much your feed needs to be monitored? Because some <laughs> uh, and then you know you, you kind of run the gamut with different alarm systems as well. So that's where you can kind of tinker with with costs on the video surveillance and alarm side, and then you can you can maybe have more freedom to regulate. The building access control system um, without worrying about maybe over overburdening the, the small grower. If that makes some sense. Thanks, Tom. That's that's super helpful, and I think will help spur some more you know conversation. I know we focus a lot on fencing in the outdoor cultivation context, but I think a fence and an indoor grow is inherently there by the structure of the, of the building from a certain perspective, anyway. So understanding you know how deep we want to get into requiring specific alarm systems, pixels from a camera perspective, 24-7 monitoring. Does that 24-7 monitoring need to be remotely accessible by 
the board or law enforcement or you know, I'm just making things up. But um, but yeah, it's fun. Uh, yeah, I just say philosophically, um, you know, I think good regulation is clear. Um, and good regulation is the minimal amount necessary to achieve the stated goals. So I, I think that that's an important one to consider where, you know, it, again, personal belief, but it's always better if, if you have the opportunity in regulation to be more specific or more broad of what you're allowing, it's better to be more broad of what you're allowing. If you have the opportunity to decide to be more specific or more broad of what you're forbidding, it's better to be more specific about what you're forbidding so that you're clear and also so that you're the least burdensome you need to be to achieve your goals. So that doesn't mean zero regulation at all, far from it, but it means that when you're considering how much regulation or how many things to regulate, that you try to be on the minimal edge of what is still effective. So I, the, when Tom was enumerating all those various things that we could or couldn't be specifying, I would strongly recommend that we stay on the lightest touch of that that we think achieves the goals. Thanks, Ivan. Anybody have any thoughts? So my thoughts are just to, and I mentioned them last time, keeping in mind sort of the downstream effect. I agree with, you know, I, I can see this from all different sides, but I think just not forgetting that when it comes to reporting theft or um, people wanting responses to those types of reports that we don't tie the hands of the folks who are left to respond. Or we give them, we give them, a, you know, some useful tools um, to help with their job. Ashley? Um, I want to be conscious of the public comment time as well, but just one other sort of thread to pull on is that we are trying to normalize the use of cannabis. We are trying to normalize its wellness and health effects. And I just want to make sure that we're creating a really nice, normal, destigmatized shopping experience. You know, I don't want to go somewhere where I can't see the windows. I don't want to go somewhere where there's not people in there. I don't want to go somewhere where I have to go down this long road to access it. I also know that Vermonters care so deeply about where and how and why it's being made. They want to tour facilities. They want to look at the plants. They want into all the different facets of how the plant is getting into the little jars that then they take home and consume. So I just, before we really like go down these rabbit holes, I mean, I do see Tom, your points for sure. You know, there are, you know, I'm not interested in rewriting or reinventing the wheel, but I really, we have to keep our lenses on of what it is like in Vermont and what we're trying to do of making this product accessible and easily accessible for folks who are of age and can consume it safely. Um, that's And uh, Kyle, a lot of what I said with regard to outdoor growth, where you've got a three week window where that crop has any value, is not true for indoor. Um, mm -hmm. The indoor year, however you set up your square foot, you could potentially be harvesting every week or every two weeks. Um, and you will have that value product. Valuable, you'll, the product will have value um, at any given point in time in that facility. Um, I'm, this one is, is um, more of a conundrum for me. It, it needs to be protected, but I don't know what level is appropriate. Thank you, Carrie. Any? Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to respond to what, what Ashley said, because it's, it's important, and that's another big issue out there. Uh, I think everyone on the industry side of it wants to have this more of a normalized experience, and I appreciate what you said, Ashley, because that's probably ex exacerbated in Vermont, where um, yeah, I, I can see where a lot of your farms and a lot of your retail, uh, you are set up to show how things are processed, how things are made, um, because it's probably more natural and it's coming from, from Vermont. But boy, that's, that's a real challenge in, in, in cannabis right now. Uh, and just to give you a perspective from, from Arizona and, and California and out west, where you know, we're, we're getting to be in Arizona somewhat 
more of a mature market now, uh, but even with my clients, um, it's, it's become more restrictive to do those tours. In the beginning, they would invite me as the attorney, and you know, I'd, I'd bring some folks from my law firm um, who I was trying to convince, listen, this isn't you know, the devil's work, this is a, a commodity like anything else. Um, look how much care they take uh, and how much security is surrounding the product. And I do those, we do those tours pretty freely. As more regulations came about, um, it's harder to access that. There's there's more limited access. There's now, you know, you have to put on all this PPE to even do the tours. Um, so that's gonna be a real, that's a real conflict um, from what you're saying and to normalize it and to get where you wanna be with other products. Uh, that's not where the industry is right now. So it's, it's gonna be a little while before, before you get there, I think. Thanks, Hal. Any, uh, any final final thoughts before we, we open it up to public comment? Anybody have a comment? Any? Any comments? All right, well, there is no public comment. <laughs> well, what I would ask is um, just, you know, thank you, thank you, NACB, for getting some words, um, you know, recommendations from a bullet point perspective. On, on a piece of paper that we can move on from an outdoor cultivation perspective. I will caveat that with, you know, we haven't discussed how farm gate sales might be impacted and separate and supplemental to those. So I think we can hold off on that for right now just because I know that um, we've got to think hard about how to do that because there's less of a, um, there's less practical examples that we can pull from. You know, I know that there's some some licenses in Canada, and um, they've been debating out west on how to do farm gate sales, but um, I want to make sure we take the time to think about that. Um, in the next meeting, I, I'd like to like to get something on, on the screen that we can all review, um, kind of see where everybody is um, in their thinking, and then if folks have time between now and Thursday to kind of dig into some of these indoor um, regulations, think about it um, from a you know, philosophical even perspective, as Sivan said, uh, how how do we want these regulations to actually look um, from a how, how specific we want to be um, with requiring certain types of certain systems and so on and so forth. And I'd like to, to move in that space and then expand into the, the more retail focus. And I know uh, Wendy Knight will be back with us on Thursday, the Deputy Commissioner of Flipper and Lottery, um, who might be able to share some perspectives on, on that too. So. With that, I think we can adjourn a couple minutes early. Um, thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your Monday. Sure.